For our lecture on cinematography, we're going to examine the film The Hurt Locker from 2008, directed by Catherine Bigelow. Interesting fact, she was the first woman to win the Academy Award for directing for this film. It was written by Mark Boll. The cinematography is from Barry Aykroyd, and we'll look extensively at all of those elements of cinematography throughout the lecture. The cast... You might notice some recognizable names, but probably at the time of this film, they weren't as recognizable. Jeremy Renner, who you might know very well from recent Marvel movies, Anthony Mackie, Brian Garrity, Guy Pearce, and Ray Fiennes are probably the most recognizable actors, or at least at the time were the most recognizable actors, but they also have the smallest roles. One of the reasons for this is that Catherine Bigelow didn't want great big name actors to detract from the story. She wanted fairly unrecognizable actors so that the audience could get a deeply involved as if this were actually happening. Screenwriter Mark Boll, who was also an embedded journalist in Iraq, described a hurt locker as a bad and painful place, and Catherine Bigelow wanted the audience to feel as if they were in the middle of something raw, immediate, and visceral, that bad and painful place. So she used a lot of techniques to place the audience in that situation. As we already talked about, one of the things she did was to not use easily recognizable actors in the film. But she also employed many other techniques that are familiar with realist cinema. Realism in cinematography, as the name might suggest, attempts to capture the spontaneity of the events and appears to mirror reality, stressing the content of what's happening over the form in which it is being presented. So it avoids extremes of technical manipulation, those things that look like cinema, fast, slow motion, unnatural color processing, very elaborate, carefully choreographed camera movements, etc. Instead, it favors available lighting, handheld cameras, cameras, as well as shooting on location to really capture the essence of the place, so it, nothing feels like it's a manufactured film. In essence, it's trying to create the sensation that the camera just so happened to be there capturing this reality, much like a documentary. We can divide the proximity of the camera to the subject into six basic shots. The extreme long shot, the long shot, the full shot, medium shot, close-up shot, and the extreme close-up shot. And we'll try to find examples of each of these from The Hurt Locker. The extreme long shot is taken from a great distance, typically an exterior shot, and it typically serves as a reference for the following closer shots, generally the traditional way of editing a scene is to start long and work your way in. So the extreme long shot gives us the location, it gives us the geography. In the opening sequence of The Hurt Locker, the handheld extreme long shot suggests a chaotic environment. And we also have this handheld extreme long shot coupled with a zooming in that coupled with that robot shaky cam connotes a sense of voyeurism that really establishes the tone of this piece. It's as if we are looking in on people that are actually doing their job. A long shot is rather difficult to define, but it's similar to the distance between the audience and a live stage performance. Uh, it includes the actors and enough of the surrounding set or scenery to interpret the major action at this particular given moment in the film. And this particular long shot I think is very telling because it's from a POV of a soldier who's looking around and what we're constantly getting a sense of in here are these soldiers looking for the danger. They don't know where the danger is coming from, so they're always looking around for this. It could be anywhere. Are these people friendlies? Are they hostiles? These soldiers just don't know and we are placed in their point of view. The full shot can be thought of as the closest range of a long shot. It's obviously closer than the extreme long shot and the long shot, and it contains the entire body from the head to the bottom of the feet just barely within the frame. This particular full shot suggests the disruption felt by everyone in this city, in this situation. It's hard to determine if these children are acting naturally to the situation. Are they running out of fear? Are they playing? We just don't know, and again, it's placing us in the point of view of these soldiers who just don't know. The medium shot is one of those highly functional shots that we see a lot in film, used a lot in dialogue exchanges. There's the two shot, the three shot, over the shoulder shot, usually taken from the waist up. This medium shot is of a civilian who won't leave his shop 
And although we can't hear the dialogue, we can tell from this rather close proximity to the action, the, the body language tells us that there is some sort of adversity here to what he's being asked to do. Unlike the theater where everything is in a sort of long shot proximity, the close-up shot is specific to film, and it gives us a lot of detail, and it gives us a specific thing on which to focus. So if we look at these two shots here, we can see it's the same proximity to the actor, but we can see the polar extreme of the tension and release with this actor from this close-up shot. And lastly is the extreme close-up shot, which is obviously a, an, a variation on the close-up shot. This is where we get beyond the head into very, very specific parts of the face, or cut away to a hand, cut away to a pen, cut away to dirt on the ground. It highlights something extremely important that would get lost in a more expansive sort of shot. Next, we'll examine the various moving camera shots, the basic of which are pans, tilts, crane shots, dolly shots, sometimes called tracking or trucking shots, zoom shots, handheld shots, steady cam shots, and lastly, aerial shots. But we'll see there are many combinations of these moving camera shots as well. Pans and tilts often get used synonymously, but they're distinct shots. Pans are horizontal movements of the camera, rotating the camera from one side to the other on a central axis. Whereas tilts are a vertical tilting of the camera on a central axis up and down. Here we can see a combination of a tilt with a tracking shot moving away from the subject as the subject is moving toward the camera. The Hurt Locker doesn't really provide us a very clear use of a crane shot, but here's a very famous one from High Noon. Here we start on a medium to medium close shot, and the camera moves on a crane in a sweeping diagonal up to end up on an extreme long shot. While the Hurt Locker does have a few dolly shots or tracking shots or trucking shots, they're usually the very shaky uh, shot. And here are a few examples from Wes Anderson, who's very famous for his use of that clear dolly tracking shot. The camera is placed on some sort of apparatus that allows it to be moved along steadily with the subject. The movement in a zoom shot is not really from the camera itself, but from adjusting the lens to magnify the subject. If a director wanted to, a director could combine a tracking and a zoom shot like Alfred Hitchcock did in Vertigo. Here we've got a camera that is moving, either pushing in or pulling out, while at the same time zooming in or zooming out the opposite direction, thus distorting the background. The subject stays at the relative scale, but the background gets very, very distorted. It's either as if the world is closing in or falling away from the subject. One type of shot that gets used constantly in the Hurt Locker is the handheld shot. The vast majority of the shots are handheld shots, and these create a sense of unease and immediacy, as if we are there experiencing it, and the camera operator doesn't have time to stabilize while capturing the events as they're occurring. Conversely, a Steadicam shot would be a camera mounted on an apparatus, a vest with an arm, and this uh, Steadicam device allows the camera operator to move fluidly with a subject or around as if the camera is floating. You get all of the mobility of the handheld shot, but with the stability of, say, a crane shot. There really aren't any examples from the Hurt Locker, but here is an example of a Steadicam shot from the film Magnolia. And lastly, the aerial shot, sometimes called a helicopter shot, sometimes called the drone shot. But here we have this sort of God's eye view from high above, looking down, moving along the vast landscapes. This example from The Shining, this aerial shot is moving, following this moving car up this mountain. 
And lastly, we'll look at the various angles with which the camera can capture the subject. The bird's eye view, the high angle view, the worm's eye view, low angle, eye level, and lastly, the oblique, sometimes called the tilted or canted view. The bird's eye view has the camera placed high above the subject looking directly down. This is a god's eye view. It's very disorienting for the audience because we're not used to this sort of view but it can often make a dramatic comment on what is going on in the scene. And here we can see this is the revelation that this character is completely surrounded by these bombs. So this bird's eye view giving all of that information is a, a, a pretty good one to depict the drama of the situation. The high angle view is from the camera looking down on the subject, and what that does is it diminishes the power of the subject, it makes the subject seem weaker. Here we've got an example of these soldiers who are particularly vulnerable at this point, and this particular high angle shot makes these soldiers seem vulnerable. The worm's eye view is the exact opposite of the bird's eye view. It's taken from an extremely low angle, usually with the camera on the ground. And what it does is make people, trees, buildings, everything look extremely dramatic, larger than life. Just as the high angle shot diminishes the power of the subject, the low angle shot conversely makes the subject appear to have more dominance. We are literally looking up at the subject. Here we can see an example where Sergeant James takes control of the situation and now has the upper hand. The camera is literally looking up at this gun, which is giving Sergeant James all of the power in that situation. The oblique angle, sometimes called the Dutch tilt, tilt or canted angle, what it does is it creates a horizon that is off kilter. It suggests a psychological imbalance. It creates a sense of anxiety by this disorientation of the witness to the subject. And lastly, we have the eye level shot, which is really the most common angle used in film, where the low angle shot provides the subject more power, the high angle shot diminishes the power of the subject. The eye level shot really doesn't make any sort of commentary on the relationship between the camera and the subject. It allows for the drama to provide the information about the relationships.